Hello everybody, this is Havoc and welcome to Against the Storm and a tutorial for absolute beginners. This is a series that I tend to make for some of the games that I have the most passion for or where I see a tutorial series will be the most benefit. And Against the Storm, while it can be overwhelming, this tutorial series will hopefully be able to ease any overwhelming features, uh, feelings that you might have. So I wanted to get that out of the way. This will be a very in-depth tutorial. But I also want to mention that you're not going to experience everything in this tutorial. And I'm going to caveat with this. I don't know everything about the game. This is to get your feet solidly put on the ground so you can start building your settlements and having success across the board. So first and foremost, thank you so much for showing up. I hope you will enjoy this very in-depth tutorial series. And I am very, very much looking forward to making it for you. Now, there is another thing that I have to say right off the bat. I do work for Hooded Horse. This is against the Storm's publisher. Now, this doesn't mean that this is sponsored, nor is there a bias here. This is from me wanting to play and make this series as a content creator, as a player who has 80-ish hours in the game at the point on this series. So, with that out of the way, we're going to start with our settings, which is where we pretty much typically always start with these because there's a lot with each individual game and especially with Against the Storm, there is a lot of crafting and unique alerts and settings that will help you along the way. So we are going into our options. Now in general, the general tab will have your typical things as your graphic quality, your language, maximum FPS, UI size. These are pretty standard. There's nothing here that I really want to point out except for, and this is uh, it's speaking to a few content creators that I know specifically, we can turn off motion blur. And in fact, we're going to do that just in case someone here has motion sickness and don't want them to, to feel like I am, you know, excluding them from anything uh, by making them nauseous. <laughs> However, there's, uh, that's pretty much the only feature that I want to, to point out in terms of everything because this is all pretty standard stuff. I'm not going to lie. It does look great, but it is very standard. Next is your gameplay, and this is where it gets very interesting and where you can really start making things on your own and make this game crafted to your experience and how you want to play. First, your relation to Aunt Lori. We'll get into that later, but this basically chooses your, your gender on which you want to be associated as, and it'll affect just basically verbiage and how she talks to you. Now, your default woodcutter's camp mode. You have woodcutters throughout the game. This is one of your most absolute essential resources. However, there are different things that you can have them do. For one, you can fell all trees, which is pretty much my default. Admittedly, I should probably not do this, because sometimes opening glades too quickly can cause some issues. So for this series, let's do avoid glades. There we go. Now you can see other things only marked trees. We can mark trees for cutting down. We're not gonna do that because I do like to be, I like my settlers, villagers to be semi-autonomous. So we're not gonna do that. However, we will avoid glades by default. That will be very good for us. Auto payment, there will be instances in the game where an auto payment is required. This is mostly at the higher tiers of gameplay difficulties. So it's not something that a total uh, beginner, an absolute beginner should need to worry about. However, I have it on instant by default because, well, I don't know what I'm going to have in terms of resources by the time the payment timer runs down. And so I want it to be instant because that way it pays it, it gets it out of the way. I don't even have to think about it and it will still alert me on basically when my payment if it hasn't been done. So definitely instant is for me. Auto track orders. This is going to be on your, your main home screen. Auto complete timed orders, absolutely. Auto collect trade routes by default. So this is just a collection system. Your orders, we will of course get into that, uh, are going to be how you gain, one of the ways you gain reputation or the queen in order to be uh, to win settlements. Your autocomplete timed orders, there are instances where you'll have eight minutes to do X, Y, and Z. And in which case, if that is completed, it will autocomplete it for you so you don't uh, forget about the timed order and you miss the opportunity and the benefits therein. Auto collect trade routes by default. 
Once you set up a trading post in this game, you can trade with the Smoldering City, which is the capital city, but also other settlements that you have previously made. So this means that uh, you will auto-collect. Now, I don't honestly know why you would ever want to not auto-collect, unless there was an instance where a successful or a completed trade route has a certain effect and you want to wait to use that effect. But for me, I'm not a super hardcore player. I'm not going to min-max to that extreme. Save internal storage limits. You do have storage limits and applies them to all newly constructed buildings of the same type. That's pretty good. Your recipe limits are fantastic. You have the capacity to say, hey, I only ever want you to make 20 lumber, for instance, or 20 wine or X number of X. You have a recipe limit book and we'll again get to all of these in the settlements deal, but that allows you to say, hey, I can set all of these recipe limits for all of these things, and I can actually save that so every settlement that I have will auto load those limits so I don't have to go back in and do it. This is very useful for me because what you don't want to do in many instances is have a building that creates unlimited things because they will use all of the resources it takes to do that infinitely. So in a, in a good resource management mindset, you do want to have recipe limits. And it's just terribly convenient to have them auto load every time. Your auto reset recipes panel, obviously if you have auto load, you don't want it to auto reset. Maybe if you want to min max and set it for each unique settlement for myself, that's not terribly necessary. Raw food consumption on by default. So you also have a food consumption panel. Get into it that you can have where raw food can be consumed by default. For me, this is obvious because you won't ever, well, I won't say ever, but rarely will you start with complex food from the get-go. And so you do want them to consume raw food. Otherwise, they'll get hungry, they'll lose their happiness or resolve as it's called, and they'll leave the settlement. Not something that's super, super beneficial for you. Raw food on by default makes sense. Complex needs consumption on by default. You have simple needs, which is primarily raw food and housing. And then more advanced features are called complex needs or complex food. Having this on by default means that they can start consuming that as soon as it's available. To me, this is a no brainer. Anything that you can do to bump up their resolve is going to be a positive. Enable all ingredients by default. This is another one. We actually might default this just for the purposes that I can show you this in our settlements. But basically this says enable all ingredients and recipes by default. There are several components of complex foods and complex services that will require multiple types of ingredients. So for instance, um, there's certain things that you could use either wood or coal or oil for. And so what you can do is instead of enabling all of them so they will consume all of them, you simply will be able to choose what ingredients you want to have where. And this is important because every settlement's different, which means every resource uh, variety that you have will be different depending on where you have settled on the world map. So for instance, you may, you'll always have wood, you won't always have access to oil or coal, but you may only have access to herbs instead of herbs and berries and vegetables. And so you may need to say, hey, maybe vegetables and berries are a little bit more rare and I want to use them for more um, complex things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, hey, I only want this one uh, ingredient. We'll get into that. Shouldn't have gone into that so deep in the settings, but that's basically what it is. Disables all recipes in workshops by default. And that's just the same thing. We are just not going to enable all ingredients. And we'll see what that looks like when we get to the settlements. Now, ingredient alternatives tooltip. This just basically says, hey, you have alternative things that you can use. Always like that, that's great. Now, sacrificing, you can sacrifice extra resources in your hearth to reduce the hostility of the fort. I know that's a very bizarre sentence to say, and out of context, you have zero idea what it means, but essentially you can continually sacrifice things during the storm season. But if you forget about it, which I oftentimes have, then you will continuously consume that where it's not necessary. So I always have stop sacrifice after the storm because I think that's very important. Now, this clockwise building rotation just depends on what area of the world you live in. That is an essential for me. I 
really haven't even thought about it. And so it's not a, it's not a big deal. Now you can order recipes and fuels by priority as well. You have the ability to do that. So that makes sense. I always have that turned on anyways. Idle farmers indication. Uh, we're going to have that on because it'll basically say, hey, you have idle farmers not doing anything. And so that means you either don't have farm laying around or something isn't right. Species panel open by default. You have different species in the game. And this means that your species panel will allow you to see everything that's broken down into your, uh, into how they're happy, what things to make them even happier. I always have this open by default so I can see everything, make informed decisions on what buildings I want to make to cater to the most species. Now you can have different types of fuel inside of your hearth. These all do different things. And we can look at that when we get to the hearth inside of our settlement. But I typically have them all on by default because, well, there's not really any super negative that I can see. Um, I can always just go in and manually change those myself. Auto pause is fantastic. There's going to be different aspects of the game where you're going to want to be like, oh yes, I need to pause and take a look at the situation. Now for me, there's only three or four, excuse me, areas where that happens. You can have them at the start of each season. Well, uh, start of the storm season would be a good idea because that's typically where all your negative modifiers kick in. And so we could definitely have start of the storm season. We'll do that for this tutorial. Small glade discovered isn't so important to me because they don't typically have any negative modifiers that I need to address. Typically, that's what I'm going for. So dangerous and forbidden glades will have those negative things that we need to look at and react to immediately. So by auto pausing on discovering them, I can then be able to take my time, not forget, and be able to address what's going on appropriately. Also your traders. Traders do not come very frequently. There are ways you can speed that up, but I wanna make sure that when my trader shows up that I am aware of it. So it will auto pause the game there. Trader departure, that's not essential for me. Not gonna have it clicked on. But the newcomer arrival is uh, as well because that allows me to, okay, I have newcomers. I need to see where my settlement's at and address things appropriately. Newcomers aren't necessarily a bad thing at all. Sometimes they may not be a good thing. So I need to know when that happens so I can then address it. We're almost done with the main things. Alerts. These alerts will really be able to help you manage your settlement well or to see when things are going awry or when things are going well. Now, I'm not going to go through all of these, but you can see here that these are pretty self-explanatory. These are just going to be, okay, I need to know when things are happening, whether it's low resolve, whether I'm missing something, whether I have an unseen event or high hostility. Time played, I don't tend to play this in such long links that I need to have that. However, that is an Anno feature uh, that I think is awesome that got moved over into here and it works very well. Your key bindings are very self-explanatory. I don't do building shortcuts because, well, I don't min-max my keyboard that much, but you can definitely see all of the things that you can do inside of your key bindings. And then last but not least, if you are a content creator and you do stream on Twitch, you can log into your Twitch and enable the uh, Twitch integration. Now this allows you to have these main features, Cornerstone Blueprint, Order, Caravan, and Newcomer Voting, which basically means your community can vote on what gets chosen. Very dangerous, especially if your community tends to be more nefarious. However, it works well. And then Force Guardians versus the Council of Elders chat minigame. Both of these are pretty cool. I enjoy them. I don't actually use them myself uh, because I don't stream that often, but it is a fun little thing that can have a, a, a bit of chaos for sure. But that's all for the settings. We have spent <laughs> close to one quarter of an hour just going over this, but I have to say that these are all very important things. This will help you set up everything that you need to cater to your style of play. And this is not what a lot of games have, and this is why I really like Against the Storm, is because you have the customization right off the bat to be able to craft this game to your specifications and how you like to play as a player. We're back at the main menu and when I hit play we are going to automatically go into the world map. Now this is my Havoc official profile. I have spent a majority of my 80 hours inside of this profile and thus it is decently far advanced. By the way this is a this does have a very robust tutorial system 
highly recommend it. If you don't want to listen to me rambling for so long, you can definitely try and tackle it. Tutorials does a great job of finding, uh, of, of filling things out for you overall. But I do want to caveat that when we get in here, there will be some advanced features, but I am choosing to do this because I can explain those advanced features to you right off the bat, instead of being limited in my selections by starting a brand new game. And welcome to the world map. There's a lot going on here. So again, I don't want you to be overwhelmed, but we are going to walk through this step by step so you understand all of its aspects. We're gonna start in the top left corner of the user interface. We're gonna rotate clockwise around everything that can be explained. And then we're gonna go into some more details throughout the map. So one, we're gonna start with our main resources. This are uh, These resources are food stockpiles, machinery, and artifacts. These three combinations of resources will be what we, you will upgrade your smoldering city or your capital city with as you progress through the game. I'm gonna say we'll get into that because there's a lot of forward thinking and things that we have to get to, but your smoldering city will allow you to build upgrades that will make your settlements more efficient. And so the gameplay loop here that I'm going to explain briefly is that at the beginning of the game, every 40 years, a storm comes, which is this big button here or this button here, and it wipes all of these settlements off the map and makes you start anew. Now, while that may not seem fair or necessary, it has to be said that that is the gameplay loop of the game. This is where the roguelite element comes into play. And as such, you have upgrades inside of your smoldering city that let you be more efficient, that persist throughout the storm. This makes your settlements more efficient, which means you can complete them technically faster before uh, you the storm ends, meaning you can have more settlements explore deeper into the world map before the storm comes and wipes everything off the map. That is the gameplay loop. You make settlements, you explore to find ways to extend the amount of time between each storm, which allows you to adventure deeper into the world map to find more uh, important what we are going to call seals and allows you to address those. So it's a fun gameplay loop. It is frustrating if you don't want to lose everything you've done, but the purpose of the game is not to see how many settlements you can establish and keep them running forever. It is to reforge these seals. And so your three resources of food stockpiles, machinery, and artifacts will do that. And these are rewards for successful settlements, which are all dependent on where you choose to settle and what difficulty. Now we have these three top bar tabs, which are, we will get into each of these. This is your smoldering city, which is your capital city. You can do a daily expedition here. You can do a training expedition. The daily expedition gets you rewards. It is uh, limited to 24 hours of real time. So you'll have to get the complete in that time. It gives you a unique challenge, which is pretty fun. And then the training expedition. If you don't want to lose a settlement, you can practice on training expedition. But I will say, I don't see any downsides to practicing. Now, over here, you have your seal fragments. Your seal fragments are gathered winning um, having successful settlements. And these seal fragments are required to reforge ancient seals. So if we go up here, excuse me, if we go up here, we can see that I'm currently trying to reach for the gold seal. That is the next one that is on my list. And you can see here the minimal difficulty that I have to do this on is Viceroy. I need 35 seal fragments. I'm not gonna get it this time around. I'll just let you know. My rewards? is that I get plus 16% citadel resources. That's what these three things are, citadel resources, at the end of the cycle. And my cycle duration permanently increases by eight. So there is your gameplay loop. I need to establish settlements along a purposeful path to go and reforge a seal before this cycle ends in order to extend the time period between each cycle. By doing that, you can see here, cycle duration has been permanently increased. That I can then go deeper and deeper and discover more hardcore seals to reforge those and extend the time. Hopefully that gameplay loop makes sense and that it does not frustrate you. Because it does frustrate some people, but it's all good. So those are your seal fragments. We need essentially 12 more, right? We need, yes, 12 more. And I don't know, yeah, I'm not getting it in the time allotted. I had some failed settlements, things didn't go too well. 
But down here is your cycle progress and your uh, timeline. And so as you can see, mud skip. It took me quite a long time to get mud skip going. Uh, and then Mirkwood didn't do well either. Mole Hill wasn't too bad. And now my latest settlement was at Drizzle Brook. And you can see here what they may offer for trade routes, what they will want for those trade routes, which is a cool thing to know once we get into trade. But essentially, this is your timeline between each cycle. And again, if we were to reset this, we would start anew. I'm not going to do that, but we totally, totally could. Now, one thing that's important to remember is that on this timeline, your in-game settlement time, which goes on a yearly basis, is directly influenced uh, and influences what you see here. So if it takes you 10 years in your settlement to success, uh, successfully complete it, then it will take you 10 years off of your cycle progress. So that is why you want your Citadel upgrades. Your Citadel upgrades will hopefully allow you to do these things much faster and thus complete the cycle decently quick. Hopefully that all makes sense. And this is your general world map in total. This will never look the same again. Each new cycle, each new storm brings in new terrain differences, keeping within the biome system that they have. But all of these will most likely not be. However, we might experience some of these modifiers where these different villages were. So that's a really cool thing to think about, that your settlements do persist sometimes in a way, but just not how you think. And so as we continue this, we're going to break down some of these things. As you can see here, I now have an extended range of where I can settle my next, uh, my next city. You have these. These main uh, events that stick up are modifiers that will allow different things to happen, positively or negatively, uh, that you can use to either gain more resources on, depending on if they're uh, difficult and or challenging, and just allows you to have some fun with it. Now we can see here that I have different effects over here, up left, depending on where I'm going to go. There are different biomes in this game. There are several different biomes. I believe there are six total biomes. And therefore, you'll have different resources within them. You'll have different, uh, different types of trees, which will produce different types of resources themselves lots to go on here but you'll notice that while i'm here with no negative modifiers within my hexes i get a reward of 91 resources in four seal fragments if we were to click on that we could see those conditions so the gift of the woodlands is rich in timber trees give more wood you can see a breakdown of all the natural resources and trees that you'll experience in this specific thing but if we were to go back if we got to a negative modifier, so this, frost, the bitter cold rises from below and engulfs the sacred flame, reduces the radius of hearths by three fields. That's a pretty significant uh, reduction, I will say. But if we were to build with that hex inside of it, you will see we will get significantly more rewards. We will get machine parts as well as, there we go, as well as a royal resupply. Now that's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot different uh, than your basics. So while you can certainly do it this way, you are limiting yourself in what you're able to do. So we aren't going to do this just yet. We'll come back to this, but we need to be able to tackle our three things up here. Starting with your smoldering city. This is the capital and this persists throughout every storm. So you don't have to worry about this resetting every time because it just won't happen. You start with your highest reforged seal. This says, hey, by reforging this, it increased the duration of the cycle by 24 years. You have your experience. I just leveled up to level 18, so I don't have much experience for the next level. And then you have these four tabs. Your buy upgrades. This is what I was talking about earlier. These resources of food, mach uh, food machinery and artifacts allow you to have lots and lots and lots of upgrades. In the beginning, they are very, very simple things. A minus two speed at which the queen's impatience grows. You have gain a permanent 1% boost. You gain new embarkation bonuses. This is what you use to make your settlements more efficient. It will allow you to have different things in your settlements, be it uh, unlocking new buildings, be it having starting abilities, depending on the species that you have. 
and they will all stack across the board. Now I could unlock this, which gives me an additional 1% boost to the global chance. And we'll be able to see all of the buffs that we experience over here. But as you can see, it gets very intense. And even after 80 hours, I still have a very long ways. To but here's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and purchase Dim Square level 11, which gives us a quicker trade arrival. Means he gets here 3% faster, which is very nice. But they'll also have one more cornerstone or blueprint for sale. That's very important. So now that applies to every settlement in my profile going forward. Now I don't have a lot left and I could certainly go ahead and buy some of these if I wanted to, but we're not going to worry about it. We're not going to worry about it today. Just know that that's what this really does. Actually a 2% boost to global production speed. That my friends is worth it. And an additional upgrade the beaver house as well. Absolutely. That is great. Awesome. I'm actually really excited, although we don't have many resources. Now, next up, you see your deeds right here. This is available here. These are different deeds that you can look through and complete. And you'll see here, 50 experience points or a new embarkation bonus for leather. Things of that nature, maybe even some decorations, maybe even some other benefits as well. Now, this is another way for you to kind of min-max your settlements in a way that you can accomplish these deeds and be able to level up a little bit faster. So you can certainly do these quickly. You can specify certain settlements to do certain objectives within it in order to fulfill these deeds. For myself, I reforged the bronze seal, which gives me a home decoration. I reforged the lead seal, gives me another decoration, and the silver seal, which gets me another decoration. But you can see here, win a game near the ruins modifier. Win a game near the Omni, uh, Ominous Presence modifier. Win a game after completing three timed order. Win with a small farm brewery tavern on the difficulty veteran. Now, this is a lot of stuff that can be relatively easily done. You do have to kind of be mindful of it. And so I highly recommend that you go through all of these and take a look at what you want to do, what's accomplishable, things of that nature. Win a game in five years or less. We could probably do this on the easiest difficulty, but we won't. And there's things that do stack up over time as well. Rush delivery for complete 50 timed orders. That gives you 50 experience. Now, you saw earlier across the world map of your daily expedition. Again, this is a very different daily thing that happens every time. Caravans prepared for all conditions. Advanced camps unlocked. That's really good. Only forbidden glades can be found and you're unable to use the pause function. Oh my word. That's terrifying. But you can totally see that by doing your different uh, different levels of difficulty that your rewards will go up as well. So this is something that can totally be done at any point of the day. So this is a great way to maybe build up some extra experience as, as well as get some resources and just have some fun if you only have time for a single settlement. Your training expedition is exactly that. You will be able to have all sorts of modifiers to see uh, just how quickly you can get through this. Here are all of your different biomes that are currently in the game. You can enable what species you want. Now you can only have three out of five. I want to mention that, so that's important. And then different conditions across the world map. I personally have never used this, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't. It's just simply a way that you can practice some maybe super intense things without losing something. And your game history. Not only does this give you a breakdown of all of your previous games uh, within the cycle, uh, maybe not necessarily cycle, uh, but uh, probably the cycle. I'm not entirely sure to be honest. Again, I'm not perfect at this. But it also gives you all your conditions, what happened, um, whether you were able to succeed or not, all of those different things. And then you have your stats. My win ratio was very low when I played this game uh, at first, but completed deeds, game started, games lost. But this is your Citadel upgrades and what I want to focus on. This is the culmination of all of your upgrades that you have down here and you all appear in your upgrade. So as you can see here, my building storage has increased. I have additional wares, extra deposit charges on all my resources. My Citadel resources I get are plus 30%. Merchandise pricing is down. My embarkation goods go up by a lot. I have a reduction in burning rate. My villager speed is 22%. The rate at which impatience grows is down. So you see all of the culmination of everything 
that you have that is a modifier that isn't a building that you've unlocked in your Citadel upgrades. So, confused yet? Because we do have one more thing. We have our home. This is Aunt Lori. This is a recent development in the game. And there you can see my home decorations. She is essentially here, here to help you figure out things and including a great deal of lore. So we're not going to go into this. I don't I don't need to uh, show this off as something you can explore yourself. But just know that Aunt Lori's here to help as well as kind of dive you into the lore aspects of the game. And so we're now back to the world map and we need to do a few things before we start our first settlement. For one, we are close to the gold seal. I won't be able to get it this time. I fully understand that. So instead, maybe I can do some things that will help show some other things off to you. That would be very nice. One, you have world events throughout. That's what every single one of these points of interest are. And they will have some benefits for you. Now, the narrow and winding path of the forest suddenly opens up. In the distance, you see a group of beavers hammering. If we paid 10 machinery, we would get 25 wood stockpile. Or we can help them out. When before year eight ends with three hearts upgraded to district level three, gain 15 crystallized dew for the rest of this duration. Now, that's nice. That's convenient. The odds of us winning before year eight while having three hearts in my settlement upgraded to level three, that's not going to be simple. And it is its own customized settlement as well, which is really cool. That's that that that's really interesting to me. But I don't think I'm going to do it because I don't think that I could, to be quite frank. Now, there are other things that we could explore. These will usually have events where you are picking and choosing what you want to do. But we're not going to do that. We're going to keep things nice and chill. We're going to diverge away for this tutorial. And we're going to go into some royal woodlands, which tend to be pretty simple. Now, when we pick here, this is our selection settlement scene. And this is how you will determine what goes into your settlement and how you start. The main tabs over here are caravans, your summary, and your condition. Now there are five species in the game. You have humans, beavers, harpies, lizards, and foxes. You'll only ever be able to have three of these five species in a single settlement. So that's something to consider. Each one of these species has their own needs, wants, and desires. Each one of these species has their own job specialties. Each one of these species comes with different benefits overall. So it really is up to you on what you want to do. Now this means that will start with eight humans. We don't start with any other species. It will only be eight humans. We will start with four beavers and four harpies with this one. And we'll start with seven lizardmen. Each comes with their own resources. But I will say, and if you hover over here, you can see a little bit about them. The beavers are hardworking on us, but also demand. Now their starting ability is they extend available trade route offers by one in each neighboring town. And these are the needs they have, as well as the gifts that they have and job specialties. We hover over humans. Humans are adept at farming. They reveal the location of one nearest patch of fertile soil. Now, if we were to get this as a newcomer, we'd be able to still utilize their starting ability. But this has the most variety. And to be honest, beavers are the best at woodworking and we want to be able to, to foster that. So we are going to start with an extended available trade offer. And we are going to start by gaining 50 cloaks, which are needed as you see, or our coats, excuse me, I said cloaks, or a complex need. So we have them selected, which means when we start, we're gonna get four beavers, four harpies, and these resources. Over here, we have embarkation point. And you can see here, we have to start with a base of three. Our upgrades have bumped that up to plus seven. However, the distance from the Citadel means we have minus two. That means we have eight embarkation points and we have all of these options. This is where it gets down to the nitty gritty and how you want to approach your settlement and what starting resources you have. For me, I always enjoy a new group of villagers right off the bat. I'm going to start with 11 villagers and that's going to be very beneficial for me. It means we have a little bit of work to do right from the get go to house all of them, but it's a minor setback in my. Now we don't have a guarantee of getting humans. However, we see here biscuits and pickled goods and ale, they will require farms to gather some of their resources. Now these guys need biscuits and pie We'll get to this in a little bit, but they both need biscuits, which means we are going to need wheat. And we can see here a grain rather. And we can see here that a small farm allows us to get this building off the right off the bat. We'll talk about this <laughs> in, the, in, in the future, but you don't have a guarantee of starting off with all of your buildings, especially from the, from the very beginning of the game. 
So I do want a small farm. Now, of course, that limits me in everything else that I choose to do. So that's a little bit of a bummer. It's It, it limits us in what we can have. However, I want to start with some extra wood. No. Yeah, we'll start with some extra wood. And then we'll go with some eggs. Mm, yeah, we'll go with some eggs. There's our embarkation bonuses taken care of. We will start with mushrooms, brick, crystallized dew. We'll get wood, eggs, villagers, and a small farm building blueprint right off the bat. Now, this is a summary of the tile that we selected. This is the Royal Woodlands, which means that uh, it's going to explain a little bit about the biome, the amount of fertile soil that this biome will have, an average amount, which means we will be able to utilize those small farms, uh, as well as possibly the other farms. The length of the game. This is your reputation and your impatience. Long story short, fulfill 14 reputation and you win. Get 14 impatience from not being a very good governor and you'll lose the settlement, including all the time you spent. And then rewards, we get stockpiles, we get seal fragments, and we get 175 experience. Now you can name your settlement anything you want, otherwise it will be named for you. We'll name it Beginner Town. And now we have our difficulty settings. Essentially, we are too far for the absolute most basic of difficulties, and I only have up to Prestige 2. You could definitely look up this information, but each difficulty has a range of factors. And starting all the way up to Viceroy, it will show us the different conditions. Now you'll see here, we're too far for the smaller ones, but if I were to bump this down to Devastating, or to Punishing, we have four still here. Uh, four negative modifiers, one positive modifier. If I go up to Viceroy, that devastating just means that these negative modifiers are even more powerful. So it's something you'll have to consider in the next episode when we tackle our settlement. You'll, you'll be able to discover that. So we have Beginner Town. We're going to be on, we'll be on Veteran this time, just so it's a little bit easier for myself to explain on the fly. Now, the conditions, we saw our summary, the conditions that says, hey, any of your tile stuff. So another Viceroy tried to settle, but unfortunately failed. You start with a small destroyed settlement in your initial glade. That's going to be potentially very useful. Allow us to rebuild buildings or tear them down for resources. And then the gift of the woodlands, trees give more wood. Now, this is what the this biome, this area, this settlement will give us in terms of resources. So we see here, we have trees, but we also have resin, plant fiber, and eggs. So that means when a creature, a species, cuts down a tree, it will give us wood, and there's also an increased chance it will drop one of these other resources, which is pretty nifty. And that's, I think, almost the same for, for just about any of these other resources. There's a chance to drop something else along with. And then we have natural resources that are going to be on the map. So we can see, for instance, that we will have clay, which is obtained by a stone cutter's camp. Or a clay pit we have a plant fiber which is obtained by uh, different other things and this is when we won't have stone for instance so if we wanted to we could say i don't want that i want some stone and i may have to trade for stone in the future or we'll say hey i don't have reeds so maybe i want to uh, do um one of the other buildings that might get me so it's definitely not a killer but it definitely will sway how you operate and what things you go after. So, well, for now, uh, we will have meat. We'll have all that stuff. We are actually going to switch things out for some stone. The stone will give us some buffs. Now, I do want to say this. We are not going to dive into the settlement thing in this episode. But don't worry. The settlement episode will come very soon after this one. But this is designed to get you on your feet to at least understand how you are going to embark on your first settlement. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching this tutorial video for Absolute Beginners and Against the Storm. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them in the comment section down below. And hopefully, you are not completely and totally overwhelmed. While you wait, while you are anticipating, if you have the game, which has been out in early access for a year, then you can totally start the tutorials now and you'll be well on your way to understanding by the next episode. Otherwise, see you then. This is Havoc. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. Do all the things you can to support, such as subscribing to the channel, giving this video a thumbs up, and also commenting down below. I read all comments, absolutely 100%.
Anyways, guys, the settlements are where it gets really, really fun, and I can't wait to show it off to you. I'll see you in the next episode.